Hello and thank you for joining this Neurology Live Cure Connections on spinal muscular atrophy, physician and patient management. Spinal muscular atrophy describes a group of disorders that are associated with spinal motor neuron loss. The age when symptoms begin correlates with the degree to which motor function is affected. Recent therapeutic advances have led to exciting treatment options for patients, which we'll be talking about today. I'm your host, Dr. Philippa Cheatham, an attending physician at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And today I'm joined by Dr. Crystal Proud, a board certified pediatric neuromuscular neurologist at the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters in Norfolk, Virginia. And also with me today is Sebastian Mills, who is going to share the details of his journey with spinal muscular atrophy and subsequent treatments with novel therapies. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome, Dr. Proud. Welcome, Sebastian. Welcome to Cure Connections. Thank you so much for joining us today. Crystal, we hear so much in the media about common diseases, cancer, heart disease, prevention, educating patients about lifestyle issues. And yet today we're talking about a disease that doesn't get much attention. Many people have not even heard of this disease, spinal muscular atrophy. Can you tell us a little bit about this disease, how common it is, who's affected by it? Certainly. So spinal muscular atrophy is a condition that leads to a deterioration of the motor nerves throughout the body. And it um, is actually something that impacts about one in 10,000 uh, children that are born. Uh, the carrier frequency is actually reasonably high, so 1 in 40 to 1 in 60 individuals are carriers of this disease. And it's autosomal recessive, meaning that it takes uh, two partners who are carriers to have a child that could be impacted by this diagnosis. And so this is a neurological disease. It is. And in the title, spinal muscular atrophy, we know as a medical term that means loss of. So this is a, a, a diagnosis that affects the spine and the muscles. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how these patients present? Certainly. So it impacts the motor nerves which sit in the spine. They sit in the front area of the spine. They send out projections to the muscles. And so when the body says, I'm going to make a movement of my arm, the brain tells these uh, anterior horn cells that are sitting in the spinal cord to send that signal out through that nerve and move the muscle. In the patients that have SMA, the health of that motor nerve sitting in the spinal column deteriorates over time. And the reason for that is because these patients have a missing or mutated gene called the SMN1 gene. And that gene is responsible for making the protein throughout the body that keeps these motor nerves healthy. Now you've, you've already mentioned that this is a genetic disease, it's an inherited disease, and yet one in 10,000, it's not rare, rare, but it's also not a common disease. Is this something that can be routinely screened for? Is this something that families may be aware that it runs in the families. I mean, how, how do we start evaluating, identifying these cases early yeah. on? That's a really great question. So with some of the newer data that we have available about early treatment, which we'll talk about more, um, we know that there is uh, uh, advantage to diagnosing and treating earlier. And so many states are moving towards doing what's called uniform newborn screening. So every child that would be born in a particular state would be screened, uh, evaluating for whether or not they were impacted genetically by this diagnosis of SMA. Uh, the states that do not have that up and running just yet uh, would have children that would present uh, throughout either infancy up into later childhood with things like weakness, um, loss of motor function over time, or failure to meet those expected motor milestones that we would typically see in childhood. Right, and you've already mentioned that this is a neurological disease. And there are many rare neurological diseases that primary care doctors may not see so commonly. Obviously, you're a specialist working in this field, seeing these kind of patients all day, every day. But I would expect that some of the initial presentations are quite vague and that I guess a lot of patients present quite late after some of the warning signs that may be obvious to an expert like you may get missed by 
community pediatric doctors or primary care doctors. Is that what happens often? That's incredibly true. The journey to diagnosis can be very long for some of our patients. Um, I think that most people when they're going through medical school, when they hear about spinal muscular atrophy, they hear about the typical infant presentation, which is usually around the age of three to six months an infant comes in, is a floppy baby with poor head control, a weak cry, um, does not reach the ability to uh, roll over or to sit up. And, um, and those babies, I think, are a little bit more recognizable, but still sometimes go unrecognized or recognized too late. It's not uncommon for them to be sent to physical therapists and say, well, let's see if we can't build that strength when probably the most appropriate thing would be to see the physical therapist to work on strength, but also see a neuromuscular specialist or a neurologist to be able to proceed with finding out why am I not meeting those milestones. Right, right. And of course, there's a huge spectrum in children's development, even in normal spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I guess not all parents have children that behave the same, especially if it's a first baby, these uh, early delayed milestones may not be so obvious to somebody that's had other children as well. Exactly, and so that's where we rely on um, not only the lack of expected progression, but loss. So many of the children that we see, no matter their age, will have lost the ability to do something or will be having more trouble doing something that used to not be so hard. And those should be true red flags to be evaluated by a neurologist. Um, I had a nine month old little girl who used to be able Able to crawl and was having more difficulty and began to actually lose the ability to crawl and then was becoming more unsteady with her sitting, that backtracking, that regression really should indicate that there is something greater that needs to be evaluated there. And I guess for many parents where they're comparing development with other children, for some there may be a sense of denial that my child is actually doing okay but it may not be as obvious to other people who see that there's quite a lag. Do you, do you come across that sometimes, that Absolutely. parents are in denial that their child is not meeting the milestones that they should be? Mm -hmm. I think that there is a great optimism and hope, and, and uh, we certainly perpetuate that in clinic, but we also need to identify when there is a problem so that we can now intervene with a treatment. Um, and so really, I consider this a true neurologic emergency. Um, if this is on my list of possibilities, if this diagnosis is in my differential, then I need to send testing quickly because treatment is going to need to be urgent.